So hello everyone and thank you very much for coming today. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be presenting the results of my thesis, which was, oh, I'm standing right in front of this, which was <laughs> um, looking at ice drafted debris in the Southern Ocean. And I was specifically looking at the potential uses and limitations of 230 thorium normalized fluxes. So I'll start off by explaining why we're even doing this. The question we're really, we're really looking to answer is how massive ice sheets grow and shrink over time. So this is a photo of the Antarctic ice sheet, and it contains about uh, 52 meters of sea level rise in the East Antarctic ice sheet and about five meters of sea level rise in the West Antarctic ice sheet. And so this is very important given uh, recent warming trends because it's important for us to understand how it might behave in our immediate future. And the way that we can best do this is to look at how it's behaved in the past. So it's not clear right now whether ice sheets generally shrink slowly and steadily or in sudden catastrophic events, uh, such as Heinrich events that have been documented in the Arctic. <clears throat> so one way that we can maybe do this is to look at records of ice drafted debris in, massive ice, um, in the surrounding ocean of massive ice sheets. So I'll explain what ice drafted debris is. When ice forms in the, in sort of towards the center of the ice sheet, it then flows outwards towards the edges. And as it flows, it scrapes off sediment from the underlying continent, and the sediment becomes embedded in the base of the ice. When the ice reaches the edge of the ice sheet, it can calve off and become an iceberg and start floating in the open ocean. And as it floats, it begins to melt from the bottom, and it will drop the sediment that's contained in its base, um, and the sediment will fall through the underlying water column and become part of the, uh, of the ocean floor. Uh, so in that way, ice drafted debris can be a record of how much ice the ice sheet is actually shedding at a certain time. <clears throat> so when we were approaching this project, we had two main questions. The first was, how can we actually best use IRD records to reconstruct the histories of a massive ice sheet, specifically in our case, Antarctica? And what is the best way to actually determine IRD fluxes? And to answer these questions, we were analyzing IRD in two deep sea sediment cores. We were looking at two cores taken from the Scotia Sea, which is located to the northeast of the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, so they were TPC-290 and TPC-288. Uh, TPC is, uh, stands for trigger and piston core, and that, those are just terms that have to do with the way they drill the samples. So the trigger core is the top uh, one meter of the sample, and the piston core is around the lower 10 meters. Um, and these cores had already been dated previously by correlating their magnetic susceptibility at different points in the core with the Epicodome C core, for which we have well-constrained dates. <clears throat> uh, and the cores go back to around 400,000 years ago but we'll only be looking at the most recent 20,000 years in this study. Uh, to give a little more context on the core locations, I've given you a map on the right of modern iceberg tracks. Um, between, these are tracks between 1999 and 2010. And uh, as you can see, at least judging by modern iceberg tracks, the two locations get a lot of um, iceberg traffic. So that's good um, because we, more ice generally means more IRD. <clears throat> so these are the cores that we're looking at to answer the two questions that we posed. And then in order to answer the questions, we'll be doing two main comparisons. Um, the first is looking to answer the question of how we can best use IRD records to, uh, to study the changes to the Antarctic ice sheet. And to answer those qu that question, we're going to be comparing uh, the recent IRD flux histories um, in the cores that we're looking at to prior reconstructions of Antarctic ice sheet retreat based on other methods. And then we'll also be comparing the cores to each other to see how much of a role local variability might play in the IRD records that we're observing. And to answer the second question about what the best way is to actually determine the IRD fluxes, we'll compare two different methods of calculating the fluxes. The first is based on the linear sedimentation rate in the core, and the second is looking at the 230 thorium concentrations. 
Um, the reason that we're not just looking at IRD concentrations over time is because this can change based on the, the fluxes of other constituents uh, in the core. So we wouldn't want to have all of a sudden a big influx of another type of sediment and then um, make it look like the IRD concentration was going down when it was actually remaining the same, for example. Um, so, the, so what we're looking is for a way to find how IRD specifically is changing over time. <clears throat> so I'll explain a little bit about each of these methods. Uh, the linear sedimentation rate um, based method uses the age model that we already have for the core. So at different points in the core's depth, we have age model tie points. And we can use the age model tie points to figure out what the linear sedimentation rate is between, um, well, we assume that, that the sedimentation rate is linear between those tie points, um, and we can find that. And then we can measure the dry bulk density of the sample, of that segment of the sample, and calculate the overall mass accumulation rate or flux of sediment. And then from that, in order to find the mass accumulation rate of any specific constituent, we can just multiply by the concentration of that constituent. So in our case, we would just multiply by weight percent of IRD, or fraction of IRD. <clears throat> so the critique of this method in the past, and the reason that we're looking at 230 thorium normalization now, is that uh, this method is limited by uncertainty, the uncertainty in the age model. So if you take two age model tie points close together, then the uncertainty in the linear sedimentation rate becomes large. But if you take them far apart, then the temporal resolution is low. So there's sort of like an inherent trade-off there. Um, the other critique of this method is that um, lateral accumulation of sediments can affect the IRD fluxes that you're seeing. So if you uh, are in a site where there is a lot of sediment being transported vertically into the site in addition to what's coming down or laterally into the site in addition to what's coming down vertically, then you're going to see uh, higher IRD fluxes than otherwise. So that's, so then um, we're looking at this other method, um, 230 thorium normalization, to see if it could possibly offer an improvement to the IRD, record, IRD flux records uh, from the linear sedimentation rate based method. So the idea behind 230 thorium normalization is that we're looking at 230 thorium concentrations in the core uh, as a proxy for IRD fluxes. So this idea is based on the fact that the ocean contains a reservoir of uranium, uh, specifically 234 uranium, which is decaying at a constant and known rate to 230 thorium. And that's assumed to have been the same historically as today, as what we observe today. <clears throat> uh, 234 uranium has a very long residence time in the ocean on the order of hundreds of thousands of years. So it stays for a very long time and the total amount is, is constant. <clears throat> um, and it's decaying, and, but 230 thorium on the other hand has a very short residence time in the ocean on the order of thir 30 years. So, um, it likes, so it essentially likes to attach to falling particles and uh, be removed from the ocean in that way. Uh, and this is called scavenging. So if there is more sediment falling at a certain time than, and the same amount of 230 thorium being produced in the overlying water column, then what you're going to see is a lower concentration of 230 thorium uh, in the sediment on the ocean floor. Uh, and this is known as detrital dilution because the falling sediment is basically diluting the concentration of 230 thorium. <clears throat> so the reason that this uh, method could potentially offer an improvement to the method I just described is because it will give you a, uh, you can measure the 230 thorium at any point in the column depth. And so you're, you're getting a data point for every, um, every point that you, as far back as you can drill. Um, and we also thought that it might be less affected by uh, lateral addition of sediments um, because we were assuming that uh, any lateral additions of sediments would have the same concentration of 230 thorium as what was falling vertically at that time. So it, since we're just looking at the concentration, we didn't think it would matter. <clears throat> um, so then after we measure the 230 thorium concentrations, we can calculate the overall mass accumulation rate um, and by this equation, which is just the production rate of 230 thorium, which we know, the depth of the water column, which we know because 
we've measured it already. And then um, we can measure the concentration of 230 thorium. <coughs> and then after we've gotten the overall mass accumulation rate, we can just get the IRD accumulation rate by multiplying by the weight percent of IRD. Um, oh, and specifically, this is the concentration of 230 thorium that's neither detrital, meaning uh, already contained in the grain, or orthogenic, meaning it's produced from some uranium that might be present. <coughs> so specifically, the, the thorium that scavenges onto it. Uh, so, okay, so now I'll explain. So since uh, lateral sediment redistribution was one of the main reasons we're even doing the study, um, I'll explain a little bit about how we can actually measure how much sediment is being redistributed laterally. And we measure this by a unitless uh, value that we call the focusing factor. Um, and I don't include all the variables because that might bore you, but essentially what you're doing is dividing the 230 thorium that's accumulated at a certain site in a given time and you're dividing it by the 230 thorium that we know has been produced in the overlying water column in the same time. <clears throat> so then a uh, focusing factor that's greater than one would imply that there's net focusing, meaning that net sediment coming into the site, and a uh, focusing factor that's less than one would imply net winnowing, or sediment being removed from the site. Um, if it's equal to one, it implies that there's no lateral redistribution and it's all coming from vertically. <clears throat> Okay, so now I'll explain how we actually measured 230 thorium concentration. Um, so from prior work at Wellesley, we have the IRD weight percent, um, and we get this by uh, sieving the sample into size fractions, so separating the grains into what sizes they are. And we assume IRD to be the largest, the coarse fraction, so the largest fraction, um, which we took to be greater than 150 microns. And this is a pretty good assumption because the other constituents that you'd expect to see in deep sea sediments aren't going to be that large. So that's how we find what the IRD weight percent is. Um, and then what I was working on was measuring the 230 thorium concentrations. Um, and so the way we do this is we start from a sample that's been ground down, and then we need to digest it um, or dissolve it. And uh, we do that with HF, ultrasonic bath, and heat. Um, and then after we've dissolved it and precipitated out um, iron, uh, then we put the sample through an ion chromatography column, which isolates the thorium and uranium isotopes. And then we measured thorium and uranium isotopes on an ICPMS, which is inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer. <coughs> uh, so what were the results of this um, analysis? So we found, so this is a plot, these are two plots. Um, showing the results from each core. The top <coughs> core is uh, two, core 288, and the bottom plot shows core 290. Um, the red line shows the fluxes that we calculated from the 230 thorium normalization, and the blue line shows the fluxes that we calculated from the linear sedimentation rate method. And as you can see, the 230 thorium normalized fluxes were generally lower, were consistently lower than the linear sedimentation rate based fluxes. Um, but they do, sort of follow similar patterns. Um, the signal seems to be more muted in the 230 thorium uh, base fluxes. The reason that the, the similar patterns that you're seeing are probably arising from the fact that there are, are arising from the fact that they both depended on the IRD weight percent. Um, and so the similarities you're seeing are coming from that and the differences are coming from the other variables that are different between them. <coughs> And here is another set of plots that is uh, comparing the methods instead of, um, or comparing the cores within each method. So the top plot is showing the 230 thorium normalized fluxes and the bottom plot is showing the LSR based fluxes. Um, the blue line shows core 290 and the red line shows core 288. And <coughs> uh, these have been smoothed with a simple running average so that we can get a better sense of the overall trends in the data. Uh, <clears throat> so from these plots, we can see that the LSR-based fluxes appear to give better uh, agreement between the cores than the 230 thorium normalized fluxes. Um, specifically in 288, it's sort of um, hard to see an overall pattern, but it looks like there is an increase around 18,000 years and 10,000 years ago. Um, 
Whereas for the LSR-based fluxes, we sort of see a increase um, and a plateau between 20 and 10,000 years ago, and then a decrease um, in more recent years. Uh, <clears throat> Core 290 from 230 thorium shows um, sort of similar trend to the LSR-based fluxes, but again, they don't. This method doesn't show us um, good agreement between the cores. <clears throat> so. Um, well, where might the differences that we're seeing between the cores come from? Um, I think that it could be due to differences in the local conditions of the core sites. Um, they could be, they are um, not that close together, so they could be getting icebergs coming from different sources. Um, this, uh, as we, going back to the iceberg tracks, we can see that at least based on modern iceberg tracks, uh, Core 290 is in a more densely traveled area than 288. So uh, if this were also true historically, then um, this might explain why, uh, um, why core 290 is generally, is generally showing higher IRD fluxes, because if we have more ice, you would expect to see more IRD. <coughs> um, so there's also a difference between the focusing that the, both sites are experiencing. Um, core 288 uh, has a lower focusing factor than core 290, which would suggest that it's subject to less focusing. So more sediment is being brought in laterally at uh, core 290. <clears throat> um, okay, so now we've compared the two methods and the two cores to each other. And now we want to look at how our, IR, how our IRD flux histories compare with prior work um, reconstructing ice sheet retreat in, Antar in Antarctica. Um, so this is a very general timeline, but I think it gives uh, the basic idea. Uh, the last glacial maximum is thought to have lasted between like 26.5 thousand years ago and uh, 20,000 years ago. Um, and then after which time the ice sheet began retreating at different places, um, beginning at different places, depending where along the ice sheet you're looking. So, um, and as you can see from our, in, in our plot, um, IRD starts off relatively low and then rises and stays pretty high uh, between 20,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago, um, after which time it decreases. So that actually agrees pretty well with, um, with prior reconstructions. Uh, it's not immediately clear whether dips in the plateau represent signal or noise. Like, it, I think it would be hard to tell unless you took more cores um, what was actually representing what was going on versus <coughs> some um, error. <coughs> um, and the reason I ended up using the LSR-based fluxes um, in this plot is because they did give, um, they appeared to give a more accurate history of the ICU retreat and they showed better agreement between the cores. Um, but this is not quite what we're expecting because we started off the project thinking that maybe 230 thorium normalization would be a better technique. Um, so what might be causing some error in 230 thorium normalized fluxes? Um, <coughs> I think that one big thing might actually be uh, occurring during lateral sediment transport. Um, and I think what might be happening is sediment sorting. So we already said that IRD are the largest grains in our sample. And large grains are less likely to be transported laterally than, small, than finer grains. It's, um, and so if most of the sediment that's coming in laterally is actually finer grains, um, these have a larger surface area and are going to bring in a larger concentration of 230 thorium. So that means that at sites with net focusing, since 230 thorium concentrations are inversely proportional to IRD, um, IRD fluxes, then the, that's going to um, result in an underestimation of IRD fluxes, uh, which is what we saw in the plots. We saw that um, the fluxes calculated with 230 thorium normalization were consistently lower than those um, calculated with LSR-based method. Um, uh, so, th so this might be um, this might be one of the reasons that we're, that 230 thorium normalization doesn't seem to work as well as LSR method. <coughs> okay. Um, so, uh, to answer the questions that we posed at the beginning of the study. Um, how can we best use IRD variability or IRD to reconstruct the history of massive ice sheets? Um, 
based on the imperfect agreement between the cores, I think that that would suggest that we would need to look at many different cores to account for local variability in the IRD records um, and to really be able to tell if what you're seeing is representative of what was going on in the ice sheet or if it's just representative of local conditions. Um, and then in answer to the second question of what's the best way to determine the fluxes, um, I think that uh, based on the better agreement between the cores um, and the better agreement with prior reconstructions, um, we've sort of decided that the LSR-based method is actually superior to 230 thorium normalization. But I still think that 230 thorium normalization might have uh, uses for IRD flux reconstructions. Um, so I think I mentioned at the beginning that the entire reason that we can't just look at IRD concentrate, the changes in IRD concentrations over time to track uh, IRD flux history is because the concentrations of other sediments might change. Um, so if 230 thorium normalization could be used on the finer sediments in the sample, uh, which it does work better for because, um, because if there is lateral transport, the finer grains are what is more likely to be moved, then we could see how, if the assumption is true or not, do, are the constituents, other constituents changing. Um, and if they aren't, then you could potentially just look at the IRD concentrations over time, which might avoid some error arising from the LSR-based calculation. <coughs> so I think there's a lot of uh, future potential for work on um, analyzing these cores specifically, taking other cores from around the Southern Ocean, um, and also looking at provenance um, of the core samples. So, um, we could look at other cores to see how well they compare to the records that we're seeing in 288 and 290. Um, and provenance, I think, especially offers a lot of potential because, um, oh, this just refers to the origin of the grains in the sample. Um, so if you can trace the IRD grains to where they originated on the continent um, based on their geochemical signatures, for example, then you could figure out where the source of the iceberg uh, was, was uh, that brought the IRD to that location, um, which would tell you something about the local behavior along the edges of the ice sheet, um, which is very valuable because the ice sheet behaves, does behave differently at different places along its edge. So, <clears throat> so that's potentially very valuable in helping to reconstruct the history. Um, so I guess just in conclusion, I think that IRD records do have a lot of potential for reconstructing uh, the history of the ice sheet because they allow you, they can allow you to go um, far back in history uh, with um, reliable dates and uh, can also give you information about local behaviors along the ice sheet edges. Um, but just like with any proxy record, we have to make sure that we think carefully about what the records are actually telling us. All right, so I would like to thank um, my thesis advisors, David McGee and Elizabeth Pierce, um, for their support and guidance throughout this project. And I'd also like to thank um, members of David's lab, Irit Tal, Christopher Kinsley, and Elena Stephanitis for their help in the lab. Um, and also to Jane Connor for help with uh, the writing and presentation skills. Okay. And now I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have about my project.